Hey, again, if you have a Bible, we're going 1 Corinthians chapter 3, and so as you're turning there, let's kind of catch us up on where we're at in this series that we're about a month into now. Uh, 1 Corinthians is a letter written by the Apostle Paul. Paul is actually the one who has started the church in Corinth, and he spent the first 18 months there establishing and preaching to this body of believers. And so he's now since left, and he's writing them, kind of trying to steer, guide, and correct some behaviors, move them back into the sanctifying growth that is uh, living according to the Holy Spirit. And by and large, there's, there's just a collective a uh, whole host of issues that they have found themselves wrapped up in. And so we kind of talked about it a little bit and said if we could sort of break it into themes or categories, we find that the church in Corinth was one that uh, lived in a really diverse and chaotic city, one of the most significant places in the Roman Empire. And because of that, uh, there was all kinds of sort of cultural influences and detractions and people coming from all kinds of different backgrounds. And by and large, it had led to uh, some really sinful things that had been integrated into the society in Corinth. And so when Paul's writing, he's writing to a church that's trying to sort of figure out, right, sort of uh, understand what it's looking like to live as Christians in a society that is really outside of Christian morality, outside of Christian living, and was really dealing with some vile and heinous and awful sin issues, and they're trying to figure out what that looks like, and, and by and large, not doing a very good job with it. And so we said 2,000 years later, what a relevant thing for us to consider that we exist in a culture that uh, causes us or kind of challenges us to understand what it looks like to know and follow the Lord in a culture that walks outside of his values and principles for life. Not only that, but in all of this, we've noticed that the church there is, is finding just about anything that they could find to create quarrels, cliques, divisions among themselves. And so it began with Paul, and we'll see this continue this morning, talking about how they have divided themselves over which leader they want to follow more, human leader, not leader in the words of Christ, but which guy is more important to them? Paul, Apollo, Cephas, maybe somebody else. And in this, it had broken them all apart. Now, we're going to find later that this is also racial division, socioeconomic division, just about anything that they could find that would really break them into separate groups or cliques, and they're really not doing a good job loving and caring for one another. And then third, uh, what's on top of all of this is they had taken and abused the idea of living and walking by the Holy Spirit as something that was mostly about gifts or charisma or ability to kind of see some fruitful evidence like it was a parlor trick rather than the fruit of the Holy Spirit that we consistently talk about in living the Christian life. And so we looked last week and said 1 Corinthians chapter 2 is really Paul redefining and clarifying what it looks like to be someone who is living in the Holy Spirit, that it wasn't necessarily about an external display of gifting, but that we receive the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit gives us wisdom from God to know the thoughts of God, to speak the words that God desires of us. And we concluded that whole thing saying one of the glorious and, and most precious things in all of the Christian life is for those who are in Christ, the Holy Spirit of God dwells in us. That, that we are not our own, but that we were bought with a price, and that price consists of us receiving the Holy Spirit. It's regenerating us. It's letting us walk in light of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, the reason for all of that is so that they would take that first issue that I mentioned, that, that they're living in a context where the world around them is really drawing them outside of Christian living uh, and apply that so that they might combat that, right? In fact, the question I would most like to deal with today is, is for us, 2,000 years later, the same question that they're dealing with then. How, how do we live in a world that is more and more divergent towards God? And in particular, towards Christianity, right? It, it, doesn't, it doesn't take much, frankly, to look 
into American culture, Western culture today, and say that there's, there's not a great deal of value and clinging to the core tenets of Christianity going on as a culture. Amen? Fair to say? In fact, I, I think it's fair to say, I'm a relatively young person, but it's fair to say in my lifetime, even in my adult lifetime, you're beginning to see kind of some seismic shifts away from Christendom. That's a, the idea that as a culture we would generally espouse and hold to values of Orthodox Christianity. Uh, and not only kind of a lean away from that, but I think you would find significant parts of the culture that would kind of press hard and say, we don't want that, we need to get away from that. Amen? Fair to say? And so in that, uh, it certainly provides both some advantages to shine as lights against a dark backdrop and also some challenges as to what it looks like to live as a Christian in a world that doesn't really value Christianity, uh, especially in comparison or in reference to what it might have looked like 50 years ago, 70 years ago, 100 years ago. And so naturally, I think the way that the church reacts outside of the sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit is one of two ways. Uh, both of them create a, a pretty good amount of danger. One is that they tend to react in legalism. And, and so legalism is that the church kind of puts upon themselves a set of rules that are mostly behavioral and external so that they would look the part and feel self-justified in the way that they live. And so we make rules about how often you have to go to church or what words you can say and not say or what foods you can eat and not eat or what things you can drink and not drink or what you ought to wear or how you ought to approach certain things, certain items, certain people. And generally speaking, all of these things tend to be things that we can control externally with just a little bit of self-discipline. Amen? You with me there? And so the danger in this is what we talked about a couple weeks ago. Paul says, hey, listen, out of all of you, I was better. I was better at putting confidence in the flesh. I was better at following the legalistic things. I did all that was required of me according to the law to be found. The word he uses is blameless. That, that if you would have taken these legalistic rules and applied them to my life, you would have found nothing wrong. Now the problem with such legalism is the man looks upon the outward appearance of another man and makes judgments, but God looks upon the heart. That's noted when he chooses David, this little guy, to be king over Saul, the one who appears to be everything that a king should be. He says God looks upon our heart and understands that even while our outward appearance might have things put together in the way that they should, that if there's still a heart of bitterness, selfish, and wicked thoughts, that you have not accomplished anything Thing by your legalistic means and the difficulty with that is that even if you are trying so hard and working so well at presenting yourself the way you ought to you know your own heart you you know your own selfish and bitter and rotten heart I certainly do I certainly do. So Paul's answer to this was that he would put no confidence in the flesh and whatever gained were things of his by his working in the flesh, he would count them as loss in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ. And so last week we look and he goes, he goes, it's not about that. In fact, the wisdom of this world was foolishness to God and God used the foolishness of the cross to give us real wisdom in the gospel and it's received not by your hard, disciplined, legalistic workings. It's received by the working of the Holy Spirit in your lives. And so he kind of eradicates this idea. Now, the difficulty with this and what it often leads to when we have this tendency to kind of ping pong from one side to the next is we drive ourselves out of that legalistic ditch. And what comes from this is sort of this license to passivity. In fact, uh, you could go, well, it's not me doing all of the heavy lifting in the gospel. It's the working of the Holy Spirit. I'm not sanctified by my legalistic self-discipline and hard work. It's the Holy Spirit working within me. That's what you just said in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. And so I can't just pull myself up by my bootstraps and work harder to be a good Christian. It's got to be God doing that in me. And so really, like, 
What do I have to do other than eat, drink, and be merry and enjoy my life? And so because this has this tendency to feel a little passive, feel a little like we don't do anything, what had happened in the church in Corinth is they had said, well, we have placed our faith in Christ. We've received the Holy Spirit. We got it. Now let us continue on to live any way we please. And so in 1 Corinthians 3, Paul's going to kind of unfold the second half of this danger and go, this license that causes you to live a worldly, sinful life, despite the fact that you know the gospel, is equally as problematic as you living in a legalism that thinks you can do it yourself. And so don't do this. In fact, here's how he's going to talk about it and warn. So we're going to work through a good portion of the chapter this morning. Look how he starts. And I, brethren could not speak to you as spiritual men, but as to men of flesh, as to infants in Christ. I gave milk to drink, not solid food, for you were not yet able to receive it. Indeed, even now you are not yet able, for you are still fleshly. For since there is jealousy and strife among you, you, are you not fleshly, and are you not walking like mere men? For when one says, I am of Paul, and another, I am of Apollos, are you not mere men? So, so pause there. Let me kind of give you a quick explanation as to what he's saying here. He says, uh, the gospel, in its depth, in its value, in its complexity in life, could continue to go on and on and on in the ways that we might learn from it. You never outgrow this. But he says, when I came to you, perhaps you have missed it because I had to speak to you like you were spiritual infants. I could not give you the deepest and most valuable pieces of theological truth because you couldn't handle them. You would have choked on them, right? We, um, we have with us for a while this uh, 10-month-old baby named Bella. She's super awesome, uh, sleeps really well, which is, which is like a really great gift uh, in all of this and uh, having, having some fun with her. Um, I got the task of like watching her yesterday, which is like a pretty enviable task. Honestly, I chose to do it between like 10 or 11 and 2.30 because I can sit in the living room watching her right in front of that TV screen where the Michigan football game was. I'm just telling you what happened, right? It included feeding her though. Uh, and so Whitney gives me a bag of these like flavored rice cakes. And they're just, and, and that's like, it's like they sprinkle some raspberry powder on like a piece of styrofoam and then they like let you eat that. And uh, they're not good, but I also didn't have any chips of my own. And so I fed her one and I ate the rest of the bag. Uh, and then as this is happening, I look down about halfway through rice chip number one and she's like, <coughs> you know, and, and like you're really nervous really fast and like, oh no, you know, it's like, I was supposed to be watching this. And, you know, a lot of, a lot of like self-guilt instantly happening. What do I do? And so, you, you know, you give her the, the little smack, the first, that's the first check smack, and, and she like spits out like half of a rice cake. And so uh, from there, I wrapped that up despite the fact that she was trying to grab it again, which is just, uh, whatever. Uh, anyways, uh, then I take the rest of the bag and I return with a bag of these like really quick dissolving like yogurt things that would be virtually impossible for anyone to choke on. Uh, the thing that I remember thinking is, is we're about to preach on what it looks like to have milk versus solid food and here's this 10 month old who can't eat something so simple that I had already devoured most of the bag while she's working on one and happens to choke on it. This is the analogy that Paul's using that if he were to give them real depth, real content in the deeper pieces of the gospel, that they would have just missed it. They wouldn't have been ready to handle it. And they evidence this because in their pride, they have found themselves saying things like, well, I prefer the teaching of Paul, or I prefer the teaching of Apollos. And so out of this, he's recognizing that they've pridefully decided that they're mature in both their legalistic response to the gospel or their licensed response to the gospel that has led them not into deeper love and understanding of Christ, but rather has led them into living however they might please, whether that's in super-religious discipline to create self-righteousness 
or whether that's in super liberal paganistic ideas of pleasure that has done things that would defame Christ in his name. And so Paul comes at him this way. He says, what then is Apollos? And what is Paul? Servants through whom you believed, even as the Lord gave opportunity to each one. I planted, Apollos watered, listen to this, but God was causing the growth. So neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything but God who causes the growth. Now he who plants and he who waters are one, but each will receive his own reward according to his own labor, for we are God's fellow workers. You are God's field. You are God's building. Here's what Paul's getting at. He goes, listen, you... You've made a mistake thinking that either I or Apollos or anyone else is really supremely valuable. Now, that doesn't mean that you don't have people in your life who are influential in your journey in understanding, knowing, and following the Lord. But ultimately, he's going, it's not, it's not them. It's God that is producing all of this. And then to kind of drill home this idea that you're not a passive recipient only of this but that you would move and grow in a way that is godly. He calls you God's field, and then the analogy he's going to follow up with is God's building, that you are something that is being worked on for the glory of God. Let's, let's look at how he describes this, uh, and then I, was just, I want to ask you kind of three really practical questions out of the text, uh, give you some time to think about them this week, uh, we'll take the Lord's Supper and worship in that way. According to the grace of God, which was given to me, like a wise master builder, I laid a foundation, and another is building on it. But each man must be careful how he builds on it. For no man can lay a foundation other than the one which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if any man builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each man's work will become evident. For the day will show it because it is to be revealed with fire, and the fire itself will test the quality of each man's work. If any man's work which he has built on it remains, he will receive a reward, and if any man's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, but he himself will will be saved, yet so as through fire. So, here's Paul's analogy. He says, I'm the one who laid the foundation spiritually in the church here in Corinth, and now another, uh, namely Apollos, is the one who is building upon that foundation. And moreover, and more broadly, all of us who are in Christ have a responsibility to be building on the foundation that is Christ, and that at some point in the future, on the day of judgment, you and I will stand accountable for what we have built, and it will be revealed through fire. So, so let's talk about it this way. I, I want to do this. I want to just ask you, out of this analogy, a couple questions. If you're a note taker, be a great opportunity to take some notes down, write these questions down. Spend some time with them throughout the course of the week thinking about what these look like in your life. Uh, If you're somebody who does highlights in your Bible, I want to give you a couple words, uh, three words, in fact, in this context that you can just highlight and note as you dwell on that or think about that in the week that comes. Here's the first one. Go with me to verse 11. For no man can lay a foundation other than the one which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. You want to highlight a word, you highlight the word foundation. You want to write down a question, here's the question. What foundation have you laid in your life? What foundation have you laid in your life? We, we sang this song, uh, Christ the Solid Rock is the name of the song, or my hope is built on nothing less, the name of the old hymn that was uh, redone and added that chorus in, Christ alone, cornerstone. You see, uh, in those days, foundations were made of rock, and there was one rock, the chief 
cornerstone that would be laid first, and then from there, all the rest of the foundation would be built off of that stone. And so from this, a small error or a small miss in judgment on the cornerstone would doom the whole rest of the building, right? And so if the foundation is off, it doesn't matter how well things progress from there, you're going to have problems. Uh, perhaps the most famous example of this, is think about this this week, is if you go, you go to France, there is uh, a tower, Italy, France, I don't know, somewhere in Europe, one of those mm, countries. Uh, and so, <laughs> if you love Europe, you're not me. Uh, the, there's a tower known as the Leaning Tower of Pisa. Anybody ever been there? Spencer? All right. When it was being built, right? I'm just... <laughs> It's built like the 1300s. I'm just giving them a hard time, right? Here's, here's the thing that's so unique about the Leaning Tower of Pisa. It's tall. Pretty tall, right? Tall, round tower. It's made out of heavy, beautiful, expensive, massive marble stones. Columns and pillars all uh, made out of this really gorgeous marble. But the problem was that the foundation, when they laid it, was uh, in shaky soil. Uh, it was not properly dug deep enough. And so uh, as time went on, the soil shifted. And slowly over time, the tower began to lean. Now, uh, in fact, the reason that you still have a leaning tower of Pisa is because in the early 1900s, they realized they could make some money off of this if they kept it standing. And so there's just massive lead weights placed on one side of the tower to try to hold it in place while it still has a four-degree lean. And to this day, you can't actually go into this beautiful tower. You have to observe it from the outside because it's not safe to be in, despite the fact that all of the rest of the construction around Around it is so well done when the foundation is faulty it's going to be awry right this is the warning that Paul's giving you can not lay your life upon any other foundation than Christ and have it be filled with meaning purpose and value in an ultimate sense now here's the warning I want to give to to you and I uh, who fill up church buildings and would say uh, that we've placed our faith in Christ uh, and what happens practically is this is a lot of times you end up building yourself upon a foundation that is not Christ despite it being something that is ultimately a pretty good thing you you end up building the foundation of your life upon your job or your career, right? You end up building the foundation of your life upon a spouse or kids. You end up building the foundation of your life upon your resume or your personal success or achievements. And all of these things aren't bad things, right? The, the Bible's clear that it's a blessing from the Lord that you would have a family, you would have kids. It's a, it's a command the Lord, that you would do your work well for the glory of His name, that you're not working as to a boss, but unto the Lord. It is a uh, recognition of the grace of God and the value of God that He would allow you to do well in all aspects of your life. These things ought to be valuable, but if they're not the foundation of your, if, if they are the foundation of your life, they will not sustain the weight of of everything that you need spiritually, only Christ does so. And so, um, we, we are like slowly, occasionally, when it is convenient and it's part of the hobby, uh, kind of renovating or redoing parts of our house. And so, uh, in this time, like there are just building materials like strewn about everywhere. In, in my house, you know, there's, there's half pieces of drywall and stubs of two by four and random pieces of trim uh, and like 68 different variations of the same subway tile that we got to figure out which one is going to go on that backsplash, whatever, you know, watch too many HGTV shows together. Uh, some, sometime we're going to return a whole bunch of individual tiles to Lowe's and the people are going to hate us, right? But, but in all of this, all of these materials have some value, do they not? I mean, a two-by-four last year was worth, like, a kidney. And so in this, they, they have, like, their place and their value. 
However, if I were to take ceramic tile and begin to build my house on top of it, I'd be sorely disappointed because you and I are meant to lay the foundation of our life on Christ. And as we do so, you watch as all of the blessings that flow from that foundation begin to return and glorify His name. And the danger, oh, oh so often for Christians, is not that we would place our foundation on wild, chaotic, and horrifying sin issues, but it frequently is that we would find the things that God has given to us as blessings and we would pervert them in such a way that they would become the ultimate, most important, idolatrous things in our life. We would try to make them the foundation of our lives, and eventually it gets crushed under the weight of everything that you are demanding of it. Amen? So what have you laid as the foundation of your life? Now, second thing, you keep going. Verse 12, he says, Now if any man builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones... Three things that withstand fire. And then wood, hay, and straw. Three things that don't. Each man's work will become evident. For the day will show it because it is to be revealed with fire. And the fire itself will test that you can highlight this word. The quality of each man's, each person's work. Here's the second question. What's the quality of your work? He doesn't note this as quantity, but, but rather quality. Not how much work have you done, but what is the nature of it? What's the goal in it? You see, um, I think one of the struggles in my own life, and, and perhaps this is a majority of the American Christian church, especially I think in an area like ours in rural conservative America where uh, we have esteemed such good values as working hard and doing your best and uh, being someone who is not idle but is laboring well, that we find ourselves as more valuable to one another, more valuable to self, and more valuable to God when we're being productive. And so the danger in this is, is we just start to work more and more and more and more and more. And eventually we start to build a pride that is developed out of, I've worked hard enough. Look at all of these things that I've done. And Paul's warning to the church in Corinth is you can build and build and build. But if you're building out of hay, straw, and wood, know that the quality of such labor may not produce any real fruit at all. It is the quality of your work. What have you done desiring to glorify the name of Jesus Christ that will ultimately matter in the end? And then the last question is this. He says, if any man's work is burned up, he will suffer loss. But he himself will be, last word, saved, yet so as through fire. The last question, the question we end today on, and in just a moment we'll, we'll take the Lord's Supper as a remembrance of this truth, is will you yourself be saved? You see, Paul's reminder in all of this is that it is not by your legalistic efforts to do the right thing. It is not by the license to do whatever you want. It is not in anything within your power, but rather that you would lay upon your life the foundation that is Jesus Christ. That those who are saved, those who know him, are the ones who have cast their faith upon Christ. And so his reminder is you can, you can work all you want. You can do all the things that you think will make you successful, but ultimately there is one chief cornerstone. Now the, the warning in this is what Dave read this morning in 1 Peter. The prophecy noted before Jesus ever came to earth was that he was the stone in which the builders rejected not all have built upon him as the foundation. In fact, I, I would trust that not all of you have placed your faith in Jesus. Not 
all of you are saved. Here's what the Bible says about it. It says that those who would call on his name would be saved. What does that look like? It means to place your faith in the death and resurrection of Jesus. We're going to pray in just a minute and sing a song together. And then uh, what we'll do is take the Lord's Supper. This is Paul's uh, instruction about this later in the same letter to the church in Corinth that it was to remember the broken body and the shed blood of Jesus Christ on a cross, taking the punishment for sin so that you and I might be saved and that in doing so, we get to proclaim his death until he returns. So why don't you pray with me and then uh, we're gonna invite our young people back in and we'll sing, we'll rejoice in taking the Lord's Supper together. Heavenly Father, thank you so much you for this morning, for this people, this church body. I pray that, that you would guide us, that you would help us, that you would make us a people who recognize and continue to come back to you as the foundation, the chief cornerstone in our life, the one who is tried and true, reliable and trustworthy, and the only one, Lord. We pray that you would continue to help us assess the quality of our work, that, that you would remove from us the distractions of this world, that you would transform our heart in such a way that all things we do, we do for the honor and the glory of your name, that you would purpose us in such a way that our desires would be to do the things that are pleasing and glorifying to you. And finally, Lord, I, I pray that your spirit would be moving and hearts and lives this morning, and maybe, maybe there's some in here who have not placed any confidence in the fact that they themselves can be saved, not by their work, but by you as the foundation, you as the chief cornerstone, your broken body, your shed blood on a cross, and that maybe they would place faith in you for the first time today. So we pray all these things in the precious name of Jesus. Amen.